Last week, we started a new series of studies on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm really excited about this series, and, and I hope you are too. I hope it's going to be very helpful for you. And, um, and normally, I'm going to try to leave time at the end of each lesson, so if you have any questions that you have, you can ask those. So I encourage you to write down, down those questions, whether it's something that is said in here that causes you to to come up with a question or something you think of through the week if you're thinking about things, but write those down so you can be prepared to ask them at the end of our teaching time tonight. And uh, now tonight, because we get started so late, we may not have a, much time at the end, but, but, uh, but keep that in mind. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and then in a, in a few moments, we're going to read from the 19th chapter of the book of Le- Le- Leviticus. And And I'll just say, you know, it could well be that you said to yourself as you came here tonight, I know that when anybody teaches on the Holy Spirit, he's bound to start in Exodus. Uh, However, you probably didn't. Uh, But we're going to that's where we're going to start. Exodus chapter three, beginning in verse 13. This is what it says. Moses said to God, I'm going to the children of Israel and will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. When they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am, excuse me, I am who I am. And he said, you will say this to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is a, 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 an intriguing passage of of scripture because it's, it's one of the earliest and most powerful revelations of the character and the nature of God. And, And as we, in this series of studies, as we talk about the Holy Spirit, we need to remember he is the Holy Spirit. I, I know the, uh, many are eager here to, to hear teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are many who want to hear uh, teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. And we're going to get to those things and we're going to take time with those things. We're going to work on the gifts of the Spirit and try to understand the gifts of the Spirit in the life of the believer in very practical ways. However, there is no way to comprehend the person and the primary work of the Holy Spirit apart from that divine adjective that is part of his very name, the Holy Spirit. There's a reason why he's not just called the the power spirit or the gift spirit. He's called the Holy Spirit. The the Holy Spirit, as we talked about last week, the Holy Spirit is the breath of God that brooded over the face of the waters and we talked about that last week. We learned that he is the agent of reportage, the inside the Trinity. He is the, uh, the he is constantly reporting back to the Father, and he's also the agent of communication with us. He's constantly teaching. We're going to be talking about that later on. We're going to talk about things that Jesus said, like when he said in John sixteen seven, "It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, then I'll, I'll send him to you." We're going to talk about all the things that Jesus said he would do when he came to us in that sense. We, we, we talked some last week about the fact that, that he is also called by, by a Hebrew idiomatic expression. He's called the finger of God. And in the finger of God, we see that he wrote the law on tablets of stone. And in Belshazzar's feast, he wrote on the wall of the palace in which Belshazzar was mocking the, the God of Israel by using holy items that he had stolen from the temple uh, in his foul and promiscuous feast. We see the finger of God alluded to in the confrontation with Pharaoh's Egyptian magicians, uh, how they they could not turn the dust into gnats or or lice, depending on your translation. Uh, But they said, because they said, we can't do that because this is the finger of God. In other words, Moses and Aaron were operating in the spirit of the God of Israel, and they were saying, We can operate in witchcraft. There are things that we can do through the power of witchcraft, but we cannot duplicate the power of the finger of God. That's the expression that even the Egyptian magicians used. And he is all of those things that we've talked about and all those things that we're going to talk about. uh, However, we need to remember above all things, he is the spirit of holiness. Uh, and, and, and so we're going we're gonna to look at this conversation between Moses and God, and it's very, very intriguing. And, and uh, this passage that we just read, God, God summons Moses through the personification of the burning bush. We all know the story and the, the event of the burning bush, and, 
And next week, I'm just going to I'm just going to tease you a little bit here. But next week, we're going to talk about the various symbolic representations of the Holy Spirit in in both the Old and the New Testament, and what they teach us because each of them is just pregnant with implications. However, I can say this this week that fire is always a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The fire the 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 fire that has engulfed this bush, but it's not being consumed by this fire. That's what draws Moses aside and God speaks out of that. Therefore, since fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, this is an encounter between Moses Moses and God through the person of the Holy Spirit. God tells Moses, go down into Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And we know it goes on and he says, I'll send Aaron with you. And he goes and says all these different things to Moses and And then there is this fascinating passage that we just read. And Moses, in a a peculiar burst, uh, not a peculiar burst, but a burst of peculiar wisdom, he says to God, look, the, the people of God have been in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. 430 years. Not just physical bondage. But emotional, mental, spiritual, and and cultural bondage. And they have been surrounded for 430 years. They have been surrounded by the vast blasphemous pantheon of, of Egyptian gods and goddesses, all of which are named. So when Moses goes down there and and, and says uh, that the that the uh, that the God of their fathers has sent them, then then they're asking him, they're going to ask him, is that, then is that Abraham? Is that the God you're talking about? Or are you talking about the fathers from this 430, era, uh, 430 year era of slavery? Which fathers are you talking about? Which God are you talking about? 430 years they've been in this. So Moses, in light of that, he says to God, he says, they're going to ask, what's his name? You say that the God of our fathers has sent, us, sent you, then what's his name? Because all the Egyptian gods and goddesses have names. There, is it Ra, the, the god of the sun? Is it Isis, the god of fertility? What's, and Moses says, what's your name? I, I can't tell them that a burning bush sent me. I just can't tell them that. Give me a name. And God answers in, in this intriguing way. He says, I am who I am. You will say this to the children of Israel. I am has sent me to you. I am who I am. In other words, God says that the most important thing that I'm now revealing to you and through you to the people who serve me is that I'm always consistent with my own character. I'm always consistent with my own character. I am who I am. I am always who I am. I am never anything else. And if I am who I am, I'm also Never just a part of who I am. I am altogether, always, all the time, all that I am. I'm never partial. I am never was. I am never shall be. I am who I am. I am who I am. You shall say this to the children of Israel. I am has sent me to you. All right. A man was uh, driving through a small town in Alabama and he saw a sign. And, and I'm going to uh, have a little fun with this, but I'm not mocking the religious enthusiasm of the sign. I'm just sort of mocking the sign itself. But it was, it was a crude, hand-painted sign with an arrow that was pointing down a side street. And it said, Holy Ghost Revival Now in Progress. However, holy was spelled H-O-L-E-Y. E-Y. Now, it dawns on me when I hear that story that the... The great impediment to a move of God in this country may may lie in our spelling. (laughs) And I'm being a little facetious, but but, uh, holy, H-O-L-E-Y, is the exact opposite of H-O-L-Y. H-O-L-E-Y, that's not your God, that's your socks. You know what I'm saying? H-O-L-E-Y means full of holes. Holy, full of holes. H-O-L-Y means lacking nothing. Entirely perfect. There is no way for us to proceed talking about the Holy Spirit until we understand what holiness means. There's been a great deal of struggle in the church trying to understand the character and the nature of holiness as it applies to God. And then when we come to Leviticus, the character and nature of holiness as it applies to the believers. So 
I want to try to give you an illustration and, and any illustration that we have to try to demonstrate or help us understand God. Of course, we know it's always going to fall short, but maybe this will help us get a handle on what I'm talking about tonight. So let's just suppose that I had a white board up here and that on that board, I could draw a circle that meets the definition of perfect circleness. It's not a real word, but I can make it up. It, it, is, it is equidistant from the center to every point of the perimeter of that circle. It's a perfect circle. There's not a gap. It meets the definition of a perfect circle. It is, it is entirely perfect and completely consistent with what we believe and what we know to be true about circleness. It is, in, in that sense then, and this is not to say this is divine, don't misunderstand, but, but it, 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 in, in that sense it is perfect and, and it meets its own definition. It is therefore a holy circle, H-O-L-Y. Now, if, if I, and I don't mean divine, I'm not talking about holy the way God is holy. I'm talking about with understanding what holy really means, that it's perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if I take an eraser and rub out that small gap on the perimeter, now it is holy, H-O-L-E-Y, because there's a hole in it. There's a gap. There's something missing. There's, there, and, and, and now, in order, to, in order to close that gap, I, I take that dry erase marker and I close the gap. I fill in the hole, but I do it with a squiggly line. It is no longer, no longer does it have a hole in it, but it, but it has something in it that does not meet the definition of circleness. So it is no, therefore no longer a holy circle. There, and, and all that to say this, there is nothing missing from God that if it were added would make him a better God than he is. And there is nothing in God that if it were removed from him would make him a better God than he is. That's the idea of holy. It's that, uh, that idea of perfectness. He is minus nothing, and, and there is nothing in him that is extraneous to his character. God is holy. I am. I'm consistent with my character. Now, here is a very, very important question. I'm going to propose to you two philosophical propositions, and I'm going to use the exact same words. The exact same words. I'm, I'm, almost, I'm only going to slightly vary the order of the words, and I want you to tell me if these two statements, these two propositions, are the same thing. You ready? First one is this. God is holy because he does not sin. The second one, God, God does not sin because he is holy. It's the same words. Exactly the same words. Proposition one. God is holy because he does not sin. Proposition number two, God doesn't sin because he is holy. Now, how many of you would say that those statements are the same? Not a single, not a single sucker in the room. You're too smart for me here. They're, 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 they're not the same. How many of you would say they're not the same? Now, I already told you, they're, they're not the same. They are forever and a day different. They're, they are eternally not, not the same. They, the chasm between those two statements is huge and fixed. And between it, many, many people fall to their death. Here's, here's why. If God is holy, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> if God is holy because he does not sin, it means that his character is the result of his actions. Therefore, we create in that definition, if we say that, Theologically speaking, we create the, 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 the problem that, the, that if God is holy because he does not sin, then we define in the terrifying proposition that God might sin some, someday, and therefore, in which case, he's no longer holy. Because now you're saying the only reason he's holy is because he doesn't sin, which opens the door to say, well, he could sin, which means he does, he's not necessarily going to be holy then. However, if God cannot sin because he's holy, then his actions are the result of his character. Do you see the difference? Therefore, if God is I am, then the possibility of God sinning is completely defined out of the equation. 
God cannot sin. He cannot countenance sin. He cannot think of sin. He cannot quit being God. God cannot will, think, or speak in opposition to his own character. You know, I heard about a young Christian man who was attending many years ago. He was attending a, uh, at the, the University of Maryland, and he, he was taking a philosophy course, and the professor of the class was an atheist. And when I say he was an atheist, he wasn't just an atheist. He was an evangelistic atheist. And uh, he, he wasn't content just to go to hell on his own. He wanted to make sure everybody went with him. And so, and if he found out, if this professor found out that you were a Christian student in his class, then your life just wasn't worth living. He would just make, make it uh, just a nightmare for you. So anyway, somebody ratted out this young man to this professor, found out that he was a Christian. And so one day after he found this out, he, he said to the student, he, he called him by name and he said, he said, please stand up. And he said, it is, it's come to my attention that you're a Christian. And the student said, well, yes, Dr. Johnson, I, I'm a Christian. And the professor looked at him and said, then you must believe in God. And the, and the student said, yes, uh, uh, actually, it's something of a prerequisite. Uh, I do believe in God. If I'm going to be a Christian, you do have to believe in God. And, and, he, and so the professor said, I want to ask you a question. And he looked at him and he said, can your God do everything? Well, that student, he thought, man, this is my chance to make a bold witness to this atheist in, in front of all of his classmates. And so he put his hot little hand in the, in the air and he said, yes, sir, Dr. Johnson, my God can do everything. And the professor looked at him and said, well, then riddle me this. Can your God make a rock that he cannot pick up? Well, you see, the professor had the student, didn't he? If God couldn't make, a, a, the, make the rock, then that violated the statement that God could do everything. And if, and if God could make it, but then he couldn't pick it up, that violated the statement as well. So and I just want to tell you right now, first of all, that is just philosophical bubblegum. That is meaningless chatter. It's just something designed to try to confuse people. But this professor had practiced this little trick to a razor's edge and used it to try to gut the faith, the faith of unsuspecting freshmen. However, if that student had only known the truth of what we're talking about today, the, the question that, that that professor asked is the most important question of eternity. It's the most important question of eternity, and, and it's the most important question to your well-being personally and individually. Can God do everything? And that question requires a bold answer of great faith that is informed with biblical truth, and the answer is no. No, God cannot do everything. And if that student had known to answer the professor that way, it, it would have ruined his entire trick. Can God do everything? Well, the answer is no. And that, that's actually a, a horrible idea. No, God cannot do everything. Our God is limited. However, he is not limited by the parameters of his power he is limited by the frontiers of his character. He's not limited in his power into what, with what he can do, but he, limits, he is limited to what he can do that's within his character. Our God cannot do everything. There are lots of things that God cannot do. God cannot sin. God cannot lie. God cannot quit being God. He cannot ever operate, think, or speak in a way that is in opposition to his own na nature. So, no, God cannot do everything, and that is exactly the wonder of his holiness. That is what he's talking about, saying, I am who I am. That is what I am. That is who I will always be. I cannot change, I, 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 and, and, and everything that I do is within this character of who I am. And I heard, I heard about a, uh, an elderly Chinese lady who was born in mainland China before the revolution, before the communists took over the country. And she was born into a, a pagan household. And she, she said that when, uh, when a new baby was born <clears throat> into a household back in those days in China, the, uh, a perfect, healthy baby, particularly a male child, because that's what they all wanted, uh, then, then the father would wrap the baby up, put him under the bed, go out into the yard and then 
shoot fireworks or blow a bugle or bang a cymbal or something to make a lot of noise. And, and when he had the attention of his gods, then he would revile those gods. He'd say, oh, I hate you. I hate you. You sent me this wretched child. You have cursed this family and I curse you. Then when the neighbors heard all of this, they would come over and they'd pull the blanket back and they'd show the baby to the neighbors and the neighbors would, would whisper, oh, beautiful, beautiful, congratulations. Then they'd cover the baby back up and say, Woe to this house! Woe to this house! This wretched excuse for a child would never bless anybody. Well, she was telling all this, and somebody heard her telling all these things, and, and, and they said, why? why would they do that? That is so strange. That's so bizarre. Why would they do that? And she said, well, it's because pagans view the gods as great, huge, powerful human beings. So, so you know, listen, you take... Human power, just, just your own mind, your own imagination, your own cr creative thought. And you multiply that by about a million times, then you have uh, an intellectual and spiritual force that must be dealt with. However, if you do that and say that's what God is, then you also magnify the human character, not just human strength and intellect. Now you have a great, horrible envious, wicked, capricious child that can destroy the world. If that's your definition of God. And that's, that's you see, pagans never, have never ever thought of their gods as being holy. They thought of gods as being powerful. That's all they considered. Gods and goddesses were not seen as anything different than us humans. They were just bigger and stronger and far more dangerous. Therefore, the idea uh, of being with a God or knowing a God or loving a God or anything like that would be absolutely horrifying to a pagan. Pagans don't want intimate encounters with the gods. They only want to get something good from the God. They want to get out of that, that encounter alive or, you know, they don't want the gods to kill their kids or whatever it is. So if the, what was happening was if the gods of this Chinese lady's parents saw that they loved the baby and that they were happy, they were afraid the gods might be envious and come and kill the baby. Therefore, they had to convince those gods, they had to manipulate those gods <clears throat> into thinking that they didn't love the child and that they weren't blessed so that the gods wouldn't come and kill the, the baby out of envy. What if, what if God, our God was like that? What if our God was whimsical and capricious and undependable. What if somebody came in off the street and, and, and said to me and said, look, I, I don't know anything about God. I just know I need to get saved. I've lived a sinful life. I have all these problems. I need forgiveness. I, I need to get saved. And, and in response, what if I looked at them and said, well, who knows? I don't know. Have a seat on the front row and Chuck and I will go into the Holy of Holies and and, uh, and, and we'll go in there and we'll send up a few trial petitions just to see how things are today. And, and, and if it looks like God's in a mood to answer prayer, then I'll, I'll clap three times and, and, and then that'll let you know that it's safe. And, and then we'll, we'll ask him and I don't know, maybe, maybe he'll forgive you. If, if it looks like God's not in the mood to answer prayer, then I'm going to stomp my foot three times. And that means you better run home because God's going to kill you. Now, why? Can I say to anybody, anywhere, whether it's a crack addict on the street or Queen Elizabeth in Buckingham Palace, why can I say to anybody, anywhere, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved? How can I do that? I can do that because God's word is anchored in God's character. I know that if he said it, he will always be consistent because he cannot act outside of his character. The Holy Bible is the result of a holy God. I, I never have to worry that God will be capricious or whimsical or changeable. Now, now what does that mean to you personally? I mean, this is all kind of theoretical, but what does it mean to you personally that God is I am? 
Now, here, here's a, a really a dreadful anthropomorphism. You remember from last week, you remember what an anthropomorphism is? That's where uh, you give God human characteristics to help us understand him. So I'm going to give you an illustration that gives him those kind of characteristics. Let's just suppose that God wakes up one morning and his blood pressure is too high and his blood sugar is too low. He, he wakes up and he looks out over, over all of creation and the first person he sees is you. That's a little sobering, isn't it? And he looks at you and goes, look at that. Look at that. What was I thinking? <laughs> Making white guys with brown eyes. Yeah, I need my divine head examined. Then he says, all right, all the white guys with brown eyes all over the world, zap, smallpox. Well, we kind of laugh at that and say, no, no, God, God would, would he? You know, we're, but no, God isn't going to do that. He's not going to do that. But why is he, is he not going to do that? He is not going to do that. And this goes back to this whole idea of holiness and I am who I am, this unchangeable nature. He's not going to do that because God's disposition towards you personally is not variable. It's not variable based on any of the realities of your life, any of your actions, any of your thoughts. His disposition towards you does not change. There's nothing, here's another way you've heard it said like this. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. It's not variable. God doesn't love you because of who you are. He loves you out of the resource of who he is. Now, now that's really good news. But, but there's even better news for us church people. It's true. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. But here's the better news. The, the better news is that there's nothing you can do to make God love you any more than he already does. See, people spend uh, their whole Christian lives trying to make God love them more, trying to do the right thing so maybe he'll love me more, when the fact of the matter is you can't change God one bit. You cannot change his love for you, not even the tiniest little bit. God loves you out of the resources of who he is. Because he is I am, he loves that's his nature. That's his character. He cannot change that. He will always love. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, some people say, well, God loves, therefore he's not going to judge anybody. No, 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 because you're leaving out the whole, the whole uh, concept of uh, purity in God. That he, and so just because God lo loves does not mean he will not judge. In fact, it's his love that will break his heart while he judges. But, but, but uh, you can't change God. It's out of the resource of who he is. God cannot not love you because he is who he is. God is I am, meaning that he cannot be anything different than he is. And John tells us what that is because he tells us God is love. L love is not one of the neat things that God does. God is love and, and that can never ever change. Therefore, getting back to what we're talking about, therefore the Holy Spirit, now watch, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. And holiness is related to this idea of God being I am. And holiness is the love of God. Holiness is the love of God. God is love, is I am, is holy. And none of that ever changes. Therefore, God says to Moses, I am who I am. All right. Now, I know that's kind of out there. But I hope you can grab onto it. But, but here's the harder part. Here comes the harder part. Let's look at Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2. Here's, here's the hard part. Now, this conversation, this is what happens here. This is not the same place, but it's still in the sort of 40-year conversation between God and Moses. Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, we've already established that God is holy. We know that. And now God says, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, am I the only one that, think, that, that, that reads that and thinks that that feels a little bit unfair? You, you know what I'm talking about? Or am I the one that sees that? God is holy. Yeah, well, yeah, this, he, he's God and all, so right. You know, he's holy. You, you see this? But God says, when, when you speak to the congregation of the children of Israel, say to them, 
you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And, it, and I don't know, but you read that, and that just feels a little over the top. It's like, well, yeah, you're holy. That's easy. That's who you are. But now you tell me I got to do this? Let me, let me try to help us reframe that in our minds a little bit. Let's just suppose that this is not a Bible study here at Restoration Life Church. Let's suppose that this is the first day of class and in upper division math class in some great university, it, 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 you know, some class, some huge thing like mathematical formulations of quantum mechanics or something like that. And it's the first day of class. And I walk in and, and I look at you and I say, you shall make an A for I am the teacher. Right? I'm the teacher and I'm telling you, you shall make an A. You must make an A. You shall make an A. Now, I don't know about you, but in that moment, that's when I just gather up my books and head straight to wherever they change uh, classes. And I'm going to say, I want to drop this class and I want to take something else. I'm going to say to the nice lady, listen, I'd like something different, like, I don't know, European basket weaving, anything. Just make sure it's a professor that's not criminally insane, okay? Now, suppose it's the same class, same class, same professor, same exact words, but he says it like this. I know you're nervous. You've never been at this level of mathematical operation before, but listen to me. You shall make an A because I'm the teacher. I'm the greatest professor of mathematics the world has ever seen. You shall make an A. Now, do you see the difference? Because when I hear that, now I'm like, yeah, I might major in math now. You see, a, a, a student at a Christian university walked up to the president of that university and he said, there, there's something I don't understand. Leviticus 19.2 says, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And he said, is that a command or a promise? And the president of the university said, yes, now you got it. Because it is a command. We are summoned to holiness. That, that didn't just go away. We are summoned to holiness. However, God says it will happen in you because I'm the God of holiness and what I do is holiness. I am who I am. Therefore, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Holiness is the work of God in us because it is the character of God. Go back to our proposition. L listen to this now. It is God holy because he doesn't sin? All right, don't stay with me. Don't fall asleep. Is God holy because he, can't, because he doesn't sin? The answer is no, no, right. You, you, however, God cannot sin because he's holy, right? We're on the same page now. Now, here's what we do. We in the Christian world, we turn Leviticus 19.2 straight upside down, and we say to people, if you won't sin, you can make yourself holy. You see, we, we do the same thing. We, 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 we reverse the very thing that makes God holy. The very thing, we, you know, we, we understand God is holy and that's why he doesn't sin. He cannot sin. It's not because of his actions that makes him holy. It's his character that, that, if, that, that, if, uh, uh, that dictates his actions. And we reverse the whole thing when it comes to us personally. And we say, if you will do right, then you'll eventually be right. If you live according to that credo, I'm here to tell you, you are doomed to failure. Zechariah chapter 4 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Here's the thing. You cannot squeeze holiness in from the outside. And that's what you're trying to do when you look at yourself and you say, If I do the right thing, then I'll be holy. No, no, no. It's about God changing us on the inside and making us holy on the inside so that we begin to do the right things. We have to see it exactly the way we understand it with God. God, it's not that God doesn't sin, therefore he is holy. It is God is holy, therefore he doesn't sin. And in you, it's that you will, you will be holy. He's going to make you holy, therefore it's going to change the way you act. Look, look, I have to say this, and some of y'all may not like this, but I, I, just look at, I, I ain't running for nothing, you know, so I don't need your vote. But, but here it is, you know, 50, 75 years ago, 
We knew what holiness was in the Pentecostal world. At least we thought we did. We were clear. Don't go to the movies. You know, don't, don't go. Don't, women don't wear makeup. Uh, women don't cut your hair. Don't wear short sleeve dresses. By the way, it was always amazing to me that most of those man-made rules were all, had, had more to do with uh, burden that they placed on the women than it did on the men. But the men, you know, they had little things like, men, don't let your hair touch your collar. Uh, all these rules. And if you did all the right things, then you were holy. The only problem was 30 or 40, 30 or 35 years into the Pentecostal movement, there were all these people who were weaned on holiness in holiness camp meetings who were mean as rattlesnakes. You know what I'm talking about? Why? Because you can't put your shoulder to the wheel. You can't put your nose to the grindstone and say, this year I'm going to be holy even if it kills me. It will kill you. The Bible tells you you can't do it. It's not by might. It's not by power. Holiness from the outside in. Holiness defined by action, hoping to change the inside. It did not work for the Pharisees, and it is not going to work for you either. It's not going to work for anybody. You can't behave well enough. You can't follow enough laws to change your heart. You know, later on in that conversation between God and Moses, God says the most amazing thing to Moses. I'm talking about back at the burning bush. God said to Moses, he, he, looks, he, he says to Moses, put your hand into your bosom or, you know, or basically put it inside your shirt. Just stick your hand inside your shirt. Anybody remember this? This moment at the burning bush? And then God says, now take it out. And, and when he took it out, it, it was what? Anybody remember? It was, that's right, it was leprous. It was just covered with leprosy. And I mean, can't you imagine? Don't you think that was just a really terrific moment for Moses? You know, I mean, you think it's bad enough when he throws a stick down and then turns into a snake and then God says, pick it up. And I'd be like, uh, no, <laughs> I ain't picking that thing up. But now, you know, he does this, he pulls his hand out and it's just completely covered with leprosy, which is just a, a deadly curse in their days. I mean, it had to be a terrific moment for Moses standing there. Wow, cool. You know, you disturb my life at 80 years of age, send me back into Egypt, you know, where there's a price on my head. And, and you tell me to lead two and a half million stiff necked rebels into the wilderness where there's no food or water and you give me leprosy. What a great God. But then God says, put it back in again. And again, I'm like, I don't, I don't know. So he, he says, put your hand back in their bosom again. This time he brings it out and, and out of his shirt. And it's what? It's it's clean it's well he's well it's pure it's it's whole now I don't pretend to know everything that God was trying to say to Moses in that but surely among the things he was trying to say is that what we do with our hands will sooner or later be the extrapolation of the condition of our hearts we can't make it flow inwardly it flows outwardly holiness doesn't flow start on the outside and flow in it's something God does on the inside and flows out. God says, I'll change you inside, in your heart. You know, there was a, a little girl who was outside and she walked up to her daddy. Her daddy was sitting on the porch and she had a flower in her hand that had just been mangled. I mean, it looked like she had been chewing on it or something. And, and she said, Daddy, why is it that when God opens a flower, it's so beautiful? And when I try to do it, it looks like this. And then before he could even begin to answer, she said, oh, I know. It's because God opens them from the inside. Out of the mouths of babes. That's a profound theological statement. God opens them from the inside. God does the work on the inside. The primary work of the Holy Spirit Pentecostals have got to get, we've got to get this because we, it's easy for us to begin to think of the Holy Spirit and think in terms of power and gifts and those sort of things, but we've got to get this, uh, that the, the primary work of the Holy Spirit, it, it, and this is a profound theological reality, the primary work of the Holy Spirit is tied to the fact that he's called the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. 
Romans chapter 1, he is the spirit of holiness that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. I'll close with this. Uh, in, in Greek mythology, there was a place known as Sirens Island. Anybody remember the stories of the sirens? And uh, the sirens were these mythical creatures who were later on memorialized theatrically. You may not know it, but it was memorialized theatrically in the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Because that's just a retelling of, of, uh, of these ancient tales. And the sirens were these human, human-like beings uh, in the form of women. Later on, they became known as mermaids, but they had these alluring vo- voices and they sat on rocks around their island. And, and when they sang, their song was irresistible. It was just absolutely irresistible. Once you heard it, you couldn't stop yourself. You were, you were just drawn to it. So they they would sit on these rocks and as ships went by, the sirens would sing and the sailors couldn't stop themselves. Knowing that they were going to die, they would drive their ships on the rocks and drown in the uh, the water and the sirens would would loot their treasure. I'm telling you, isn't that a perfect picture of sin? I mean, isn't it perfect? Knowing that this alcohol is turning my liver into stone and yet I'll stir, still turn into the parking lot at the liquor store, knowing that meth is going to fry my brain, but I still do it. I can't stop myself. That's the siren call of sin, that when it calls, you just can't stop. Well, in Greek mythology, there were two men who made it past the siren's island safely. They did it in different ways. The first was Odysseus, also known by us as Ulysses, and he did it in the, in the Odyssey. He found out about the island of the sirens. So what he did was he poured molten wax into the ears of his sailors and then he tied them all up in chains and he, he chained himself to the main mast. Uh, uh, however, he, he, he didn't have anybody to pour wax in his ears and he commanded his sailor, sailors when the, ships, uh, when the ships sailed past the island of the sirens, he told them that they were to scream at the top of their lungs to see if they could drown out the siren song. So they, they sailed past the island of the sirens in chains, in bondage, with their ears stuffed, and screaming, Ah! And they, and they made it. Then there was another man who made it safely past the island of the sirens. Anybody here remember Jason and the Argonauts? Uh, his ship was called the Argo. And so the, his crew were known as the Argonauts. That's where that comes from. And when Jason heard about the island of the sirens, he, he took a completely different course. Jason did not chain up anybody. He did not put wax in their ears. What he did is he found a magic lute player. And when this lute player played his lute, no one could hear anything else as long as he played his lute. So Jason put this magic lute player up on the deck and Jason and the Argonauts all sat sat at his feet around the deck and listened to him play. And when he played, the music so captured them that, that when they went past the island of the sirens, they just couldn't hear their song. Homer writes that when the sirens realized that the Argonauts could not hear them, that they went silent to, to hear the lute player and they turned to stone and no one ever died at the island of the sirens ever again. Sanctification, the work of holiness, is not just screaming against the siren sound of sin. It's hearing a sweeter melody and falling in love with the Holy Spirit. We are not holy because we do not sin. We do not sin Because God is making us holy. Because he is holy. Because that is his character. That's the work he's doing in us. God's breath is the spirit of holiness. Holiness is not bad news. It's not a frightening prospect. It's not a hard thing for us to figure out and make happen. Holiness is good news. Because that's God working to change me on the inside. Amen. Bow your head. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your presence here in this place. And I lo- pray, Lord, that tonight, as, as we have taken time to look at this, Lord, that you would just, maybe there's some people that just need to find some freedom from trying to work so hard to try to earn your love, try to make you, 
make you love them more when all the while it's just who you are. It's just in your character. You cannot love us any more. You cannot love us any less. Uh, but God, that the fact is because you are a holy God, because that's your character, that is what you're doing in us. And I pray, God, that we would let you do that work and we would take our hands off and we would say, Lord, create in me a, a clean and a holy heart. Change my heart. Change my desires. Help me to hear the sweet song of the Spirit so that I don't hear that siren sound of sin anymore and my heart begins to change and, and I just don't respond to those old desires because that's not what I want anymore because I've fallen in love with you. Lord, have your way. and Do what you want to do in us. We pray it all in the strong, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.